On behalf of the Gabriel Dumont Institute Press, I'd like to welcome everyone to our virtual launch of Road Allowance Kitten Broken Promises. To start our event, Senator Nora Cummings is going to be offering an opening prayer. Good morning, Lord Creator, and thank you for this day you've given us. Creator, it's always a blessing to be able to talk with you every day, the day you've given us. I ask you, Creator, to bless us and our families and our loved ones our people that have left us. I pray for their families as well. And I pray for our people that are, are, are homeless people. I, I, I was praying for them this morning because uh, there's some of these children and some of these grandchildren and we know we're all family and we need to, to continue to work and pray for all of our people. But I, I, pray, I pray for, for so many of our, our, our people and I, as you created to continue to guide us in the times that we're in right now with this COVID and people in the hospital, our elders that are in hospital, I, I offer prayers for them. Uh, my fellow elder that I work with, uh, Harry Lafon, he he's uh, going through his surgery maybe today and I wish him the best because we have such working relationships in our community and, and I pray creator that their family is guided and giving him strength. So I thank you today, Lord Creator, and I bless. I want to bless my young people I work with, and especially uh, Wilford, who I'm going to be having the opportunity to to um, to help him or and say some things about his his writing. And that again is from you, Creator. You've you've guided our young our young people. So we thank you. Amen. Well, I'm here today to to uh, speak on. Uh, an honoring uh, a, a, a great man that has done the Road Lounge Kitten Broken Promises and the Road Lounge Kitten. I had the opportunity of reading these and um, it brought back so many memories for me as a Road Lounge person. And, and you know, for this, the work that he does in our community, the books that he has written and helped our children in schools. It's an honor for me to be here. Every, every part of me feels so honored and, and excited to be able to come here and honor you, Wilfred, for the work you do. And not only does he do that, he works within our community. There's a, a, a man that does so many works and helps up so many people and he has such a good heart. And I had the opportunity to get know, to know Wilfred. I've known little of him before until recently over the past couple of years. And I have the opportunity of working with him and the kindness he shows, not only to all of our people, but the kindness he shows to us as, 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 um, as elders um, or old people and, you know, and, and all of our young people. And, and I have the opportunity to, to talk with him from day to day. We bounce our issues off of talking about the old days. And he has that so much history and, and so much understanding. And, and again, I, I want to say not only to him, but to his family, his sisters and them that have mentored him and his, his family, because he talks to me about them, they were important to him. And when we have family that are important to especially our older people, that's, that's, that's a good teaching. That's a good mentoring. They are good family members. And they have, have taught and teach him his ways, and he's never lost his ways in a way that some of our poor people have lost. So I want to say again, thank the, his family and his for, for being there for him. And I want to thank Wilfred for being here with us. And I hope to see many more work and the work that he does with our young children. So I want to say thank you, Mitchiff, um, to a nice Mitchiff man. And, and I want to say to him, continue your work. And creator will watch over you and lots of love. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. It's always so great to have you as part of our special events. I'd like to welcome the elders, children, friends, and family who are joining us for the launch of Road Allowance Kitten Broken Promises. Written by Wilfred Barton, illustrated by Christina Johns, and translated into Michif by Norman Flurry. This much anticipated book is the sequel to Road Allowance Kitten. 
and it continues the story of Rosie, Madeline, their families, and of course, Kitten. We're launching this book today in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. GDI's mandate is to educate and train Métis citizens and to promote and preserve Métis history and culture. We accomplish this through websites, videos, workshops, schooling, and of course through books. Wilfred is the author of a number of other books published by the Institute and available through Gabriel Dumont Institute Press. These include Ruguru Mickey, illustrated by Leah Marie Dorian, The Big Tees, a story of Eliza Delorme and her cousin Edward Beaupre, the Willow Bunch Giant, illustrated by George Gingra. Wilfred is also the author of our first series of early readers, Tanche Books, which he co-wrote with Angela Caron. He has also co-authored three books with Anne Patton, Fiddle Dancer, Dancing in My Bones, and Call of the Fiddle. Rodolown's Kitten, Broken Promises is Wilfred's latest book. Please put your hands together at home for Wilfred. Tanche Kiawao. I am very honored and humbled to be presenting my latest book, Rodolount's Kitten, Broken Promises, to you at this book launch. And I thank Gabriel Dumont Institute um, immensely for publishing the sequel to the first book, Rodolount's Kitten. Uh, when we did the book launch in Regina for Rodolount's Kitten, the very first question was, what happened to the people and what happened to Kitten? And so immediately, uh, the wheels started moving and we decided that there had to be a sequel to Rodolount's Kitten. And so today I'm going to present to you Rodolount's Kitten, Broken Promises. Uh, the dedication to this book reads, to Sandy Pelche and her family for sharing the relocation experience of their mother, Marcy Agopsiewicz, and their grandmother, Josephine Pelche, from Lestock to Green Lake. We also want to honor her great-grandmother, Marguerite Rose Gallarneau, also known as Bijish. It was Marcy's wish for her descendants and all of us to remember this traumatic story. It is part of our Métis history, never to be forgotten. Meadow Lake, hollered the conductor, gather up your things. Omishka kitten, wake up. It's time to get off this rattly old train, whispered Rosie as she swept the calico into her arms. Take good care of that beautiful cat, shouted the conductor as Rosie stepped down from the train. There, at the bottom of the stairs, were crowds of strangers staring at them. Amongst the crowd, there were the men in suits. Rosie and Madeline immediately hid behind Mama. Pitch your tents along the edge of town, the men in suits yelled. You'll go to Green Lake in a few days. Rosie emerged the minute they left and began helping Mama collect their things while Papa unloaded the horses and wagon. She wondered what their promised land in Green Lake would be like. Ah, Satan! Rosie sputtered. What are those pesky little creatures flying into my mouth? They're just fish flies, said Papa. They won't hurt you. The horses, swishing their tails wildly from side to side, didn't like them one bit either. The bugs didn't bother Kitten, though. They were just one more thing to chase. Two days later, everyone set off for Green Lake. Long stretches of road made of logs kept the wagons from sinking into the mud and muskeg. It was so bumpy that Rosie had to hold Kitten tightly so the frightened cat wouldn't jump off the wagon. This road is going to shake my teeth out, chattered Papa. My bones are going to break, stammered Rosie. That was the only laugh they had that day. Upon arrival in Green Lake, they found out their land wasn't surveyed. They had to set up camp again. It didn't take long for everyone to get restless. What's going on? asked Mama. We can't like, live like this forever. There is nothing here for us. I want to go back home, whimpered Rosie. Please, Papa. Be patient, my girl, responded Papa. I'll try and find out what is going on. Tell them we don't want any more fish dumped on the ground, added Mama. We aren't dogs. Rosie was sad. She missed the flat treeless prairie with its big blue skies. She missed her cozy little house on the Rodolance where she spent her days doing fun things. In the south, they didn't have to rub axle grease on the horse's open sores caused by the horseflies or live in tents. She longed to go home. 
Kitten didn't have a worry in the world. She spent most of her day stalking ground squirrels. She'd wait for the cheeky little rodents over one hole, and a few seconds later they'd pop up in another. It was a fun game for the ground squirrels, but frustrating for Kitten. One day, Papa and Uncle finally met with the men in suits. They'll take us out to the land in a couple days and show us where we're going to live, Uncle announced. Days passed before they got to see the promised land. What's wrong, Papa asked Rosie when he and Uncle returned. By the look on Papa's face, he was not pleased. They nailed boards with our names onto the trees to show us where we'd be living, but they still aren't finished surveying. There's just bush and mosquitoes and nothing but broken promises. Mama asked one of the ladies in town about school for us, added Ro Rosie. They only have room for their own kids. Another broken promise, exclaimed Papa. There is nothing here for us. Let's go back home. Now this was music to Rosie's ears. She grabbed Madeline's hand and did a happy dance. The next day, they were on the move. They didn't know exactly how to get back, but they knew where the sun came up and where it went down. They knew where the North Star was in the sky, and that is how they would navigate home. The first day, they headed south of Green Lake. Wherever they headed, there was bush as far as you can see. Every time they stopped to rest the horses, Rosie and Madeline let Kitten explore. Watch Kitten, warned Mama. You don't want her to get eaten by bears. It wasn't a problem because Kitten was a bit of a scaredy cat. She stuck close to the girls. Papa motioned for the other wagon to stop. Let's stay here for the night. There's plenty of grass and water for the horses and shade for our tents. Look at all those berries, Rosie shouted. Don't go far, girls. Where there are berries, you'll find bears, warned Mama. Papa and Uncle went off to see if they could get a partridge, a rabbit, or a deer for supper. The land provided for us, said Papa upon his return. The second day on the road, they spotted a cabin. Sure enough, it was the home of a Mitchell family. There were some kids and an orange tabby named Tommy. Everyone got along well, even Kitten and Tommy. That night, the trapper played his fiddle, his wife played the squeeze box, and Uncle played the spoons. Everyone danced around the fire. This is just like back home, laughed Rosie. The trapper needed help fixing his cabin, but so Papa and Uncle helped. In return, he gave them flour, dried meat, and directions. With spirits high and a root in place, they struck off after sunrise. They were full of purpose and hope. The next evening, there were fewer trees with small grain fields here and there. They decided to go off-road for the night. It was dusk when they got the tent set up and supper started. All of a sudden, they heard shots. Bang! Bang! Within seconds, two men mounted on spirited horses rushed into camp. Quick as jackrabbits, Rosie and Madeline scrambled into their tent. What are you doing here? roared one man. Who gave you permission to set up camp? yelled the other. We're going south, replied Papa. We need a place to camp for the night. Not on my land. We don't want any trouble, exclaimed Papa. We'll leave in the morning. No, you'll leave right now demanded the man. Quickly, the horses were hitched to the wagon and the tents loaded. Be on your way and don't come back, shouted the men. So from that day on, they traveled at night and stayed off the main roads. They didn't want any more trouble. After a few days, they got to the South Saskatchewan River and found a nice spot to camp by the water. It was close to the ferry crossing. After a good night's rest, Papa and Uncle decided to try and find some work nearby. When they returned, Papa announced, We can make some money picking rocks and roots for a farmer for about three days. Rosie and Madeline got excited. Now we have time to go and explore. Don't go far and keep out of the water, reminded Papa. Kitten is tied up, Rosie called as she and Madeline scurried off. Let's skip rocks in the water, suggested Madeline. We can make boats out of sticks and watch them sail away, added Rosie. After a while, they heard Mama calling and rushed back to the camp. The first thing they noticed was a loose rope. Where's Kitten? questioned Rosie. I don't know. I thought she was with you, said Mama. Oh, no! shouted the girls in unison. Kitten! 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 they hollered as they frantically searched behind bushes and rocks. Shh! Oh, yeah, whispered Rosie. 
Kitten hates dogs, answered Madeline. Let's go. Sure enough, there was Kitten in a tree with the dog below. Tail puffed and back arched. Kitten was an impressive sight. The dog was tail wagging happy and ran towards the girls. Just then a boy broke through the bushes shouting, That's my dog! What's he barking at? Our cat is up that tree, cried Madeline. She is scared. Oh, my dog won't hurt her. He just wants to play, announced the boy. I don't think she'll come down with the dog barking at her, said Madeline. The boy got the hint and left with the dog. How will we ever get her down, asked Rosie. They waited and waited for Kitten to come down on her own, and at the end of the day, Mama brought them bannock sandwiches and a sealer of water. You can't stay here all night, she told them. They tried bribing Kitten with food, then dangling a feather and singing, Kiss bin kisa kitten. Nothing worked. It was getting dark when Papa and Uncle came back from working in the fields. I'll put you on my shoulders and see if you can reach her, Papa proposed. Papa stood beside the tree and hoisted Rosie up. Immediately, Kitten jumped onto Rosie. The next day, they got back on the road. After days and days of traveling in the hot sun, the skies darkened and a blustery wind blew in. A terrible storm is coming, Mama yelled. Let's drive the horses down into the valley along the lake quickly. Uncle called out, pull the tent canvas from the wagon and crawl under it. There's no time to put it up. Hobble the horses, screamed Papa above the roar of the wind. Kitten did not like this display of lights one bit. When the thunder cracked, she bolted. We have to find Kitten, wailed Madeline, as they rushed around getting soaked to the bone. I think I'm going to stop the story there and dangle this little tidbit in front of you. If you want to know what happened to the end of the story, then you have to read to the end of the story. But I just want to tell you a little bit about um, what happened to the descendants of uh, the many people that were relocated during this time. So many people were relocated from the south to the north to Green Lake and many of them stayed but many of them also left and they wandered off into different urban centers, different small towns and villages. But you will find many of the descendants of the Road Allowance people scattered throughout Saskatchewan to this day. They're still alive, they're still with us, they're still going strong. And so I think the story, this particular story, shows that there is strong resilience amongst our Métis people. I was very fortunate to be able to solicit two classrooms to listen to the story, Rodelon's Kitten Broken Promises, and then come up with some questions specifically for this broadcast. So I'm going to read some of their questions and I thank them very much for um, the in-depth way that they were thinking about the story. So this is Clyde and he's in grade three from Regina in Arcola Community School. And he asks, how long did the trip take? What a great question. The, the day of the trip probably took at least 64 days because the gestation period of a cat um, that's going to have kittens is 64 days. So it would probably take over two months for uh, someone to go from that distance to um, the south. They had lots of obstacles in the way. Just like in this story, people stopped along the way. They camped, they rested, um, they worked. They had to get enough money to continue the journey to buy provisions. And so it probably would take about two months or more. Uh, summer was almost over when um, the families did arrive in the south. And so that limited them uh, in their earning power because they now have wasted the whole summer just traveling and not making money uh, to buy provisions for the winter. The second question comes from Nicholas at our Cola Community School and he asks, why is Kitten the character in this book? And that's a really good question too. Uh, I chose Kitten because when I was um, when I heard these stories from the old people, all three of the old people that told me this story, their stories were very similar. And a couple of those old people in their stories was a cat. However, the cat didn't come to such a good ending in their stories. And I thought, 
if I'm going to write this story and record this history, I want it to be more of a happy ending. And that's why this book is a, a work of fiction and not uh, based on some true stories. So I took the kitten and I made Kitten a central character to uh, be attractive to younger readers so that they would enjoy the story, they could follow the life of Kitten. The next question is, how many Métis people had to leave? And that's by Peyton from our Cola School as well. So a lot of people, a lot of Métis people were relocated. So almost all Métis people who lived on road allowances across the entire province of Saskatchewan, eventually were relocated. So in the south, they were re relocated earlier um, because that's where most of the farms were and that's, um, uh, they wanted people to move out of there. But then as years passed, they kept going further and further north and relocating more and more people off of the road allowances. Um, so uh, how many people had to leave? A lot. A lot of the population were living on crown land, on road allowances, um, and so they had to be displaced. And so they moved, and many of them moved to uh, villages and towns and cities, like I said earlier. This question is from Luke, and he's from Brownell School in Saskatoon. And he asks, why didn't the farmers let them use the land to camp? So if you remember in the story, the farmers are camp, um, the families are camping and the farmers come and say, get off our land. And at that time, Métis people were, um, were segregated and uh, people didn't want them to be around. So there were racist attitudes, there were stereotypes that people had about Métis people. And so they were asserting themselves to get off of their, off of their land. They owned the land, they weren't being very kind, and uh, so th this is a true fact from the stories of the old people. Um, they did travel at night, and the reason they travel at night is because people treated them so poorly. And um, that is a true fact, and they did make it to their destination without having to encounter a lot of um, racism. The next question is, by, from Bruce, and he's also from Brownell School in Saskatoon. When they got back home, were they going to rebuild their houses? So if we remember from the first story, Road Lounge's Kitten, you'll notice at the very end of that story, they burned all of the houses on the Road Lounge in Lestock at Little Chicago. And so they really didn't have a place to go back to. And that happened repeatedly over the province of Saskatchewan where the houses were burned immediately after the Métis people were evacuated. So when they, they didn't have a house to rebuild when they went back home. They weren't allowed to go back to the road allowance. But many Métis people went back and worked in cities. In this particular story, I didn't mention it in the story, but they found their relatives and they had built um, tar paper shack on the edge of the dump in Regina. And so um, that's where Rosie and her family and Madeline and her family stayed with their relatives until they got back on their feet. And so we can assume that most people got jobs, provided for their families because their descendants are still around today. So the last question is from Gurleen from Brownell School in Saskatoon. And it is, what is a road allowance? So that's a really important question because um, both books are based on uh, the premise that these people uh, lived in, or on a road allowance. So uh, a road allowance is a narrow strip of land. Uh, it was intended to be a road, but uh, in the grid system in Saskatchewan, every two miles a road was to be built. However, lots of the roads never got built because they didn't need to have a road there because there wasn't enough people or it went into a lake or a big slough or maybe even a reserve was there and so they didn't build the road. So these little pieces of land, narrow strips of land, were uh, free and many Métis people uh, squatted on this land uh, because they worked for local farmers picking rocks and roots and different things and earning a living. So then they would be close to their work source. 
I would like to thank uh, Destiny Casey at Arcola Community School uh, for inviting me into her classroom and letting me read to the students and having them come up with questions for this event. I'd also like to thank Glenda Osadchuk from uh, Brownell School here in Saskatoon for opening up her classroom. Uh, it's a grade three four classroom and uh, Angie Karen is the principal there and uh, I just want to thank them uh, for opening up their classrooms and inviting me in, having me read the story, and um, providing questions. Thank you very much to all of my family and my friends and the general community for listening to this book launch today. Especially want to thank Gabriel Dumont Institute for publishing such an important story. I especially want to thank uh, Christina Johns who did the illustrations for both of these stories. They're outstanding, they're beautiful. A big, huge merci to Norman Fleury for translating the books uh, into Machif, one, um, our heritage language. Years ago, when Isidore Palche told this story to a colleague of mine and I, he made us promise that we would continue telling this story because it's a very important part of our Métis history in Saskatchewan. Um, so just thank you everyone for watching today and um, good night. Thank you, Wilfred. It's always a joy to hear you read your stories. And those questions from the students were awesome. And now, here's illustrator Christina Johns to give some insight into her illustrations. Tanse, everyone. My name is Christina Johns, and I'm the illustrator of Road Allowance Kitten 2. I'm coming to you from Pasqua First Nation, where I live and work, which is located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nations. It has been such an honour to work with Wilfred Burton and all the good folks at Gabriel Dumont Institute, like David Morin and Karen Schmann, all who had the confidence in me to be able to illustrate this wonderful story and bring it to life. As the illustrator, I get to talk to you about the pictures of the book and the thoughts or feelings that I was trying to get across. So let's start with the cover. Once again, David Morin chose the cover picture from the very first illustration that I did, just like in book one. And he chose it probably because it's colorful and it gives off a sense of where the story is going to take place. The picture gives a feeling of somewhere different other than the prairies. And it's also kind of a little lonely picture and I created it that way because I thought, I wonder if pets get homesick as well. And so I was thinking kitten might be homesick uh, being taken away from the prairies. One of the other things that I really wanted to do was to pay homage to the beauty of Saskatchewan and all of the kinds of weather that you can experience living in Saskatchewan. You could have beautiful sunrises, gorgeous sunsets, cool days, hot days, cloudless skies, and then really intense storms. And that's one of the things that I really wanted to showcase in the illustrations, um, was all the beauty that is Saskatchewan. We definitely are the land of the living skies, that's true. And that's why you'll also see a lot of sunsets and silhouettes. And I just love that time of day and I observe sunsets a lot, go for drives and take lots of photos. One of the things you may notice in the story is that Rosie and her cousin are looking a little bit more grown up. Well, when I started painting, I wanted to put myself in Rosie's shoes and I tried to think of what it would be like experiencing this firsthand as a small child. It might be really scary growing up so far from what you're used to, so far from home, and seeing all of the struggles and hardships that your family and friends and that your people are facing. I think that would tend to make a young lady grow up very quickly. And so I kind of wanted to put that perspective on it too, is that she's no longer a baby anymore and doesn't need her blanket for comfort. Kitten is her comfort. And Kitten is also um, her relationship to her cousin. And um, she she needs those things, her family and her her cat to to bring her through these hard times. In the first scene of the story, where Rosie steps off the train into this new place at Meadow Lake, if you look at the picture, she's kind of stepping off this dark shadow of the train 
into this colorful light, which is supposed to be a promising place. If you remember in Road Allowance Kitten 1, Papa had explained that there was all of these promises of their own land, lots of trees to build houses, lots of good fishing and hunting, and a promise of a school. And there was all of this hope that was built up. So it was supposed to be a positive move for Métis people at the time. So she's stepping into this hopeful place, and that's why she's stepping from the dark into the light. Another thing you may notice about the illustrations, for all of the things that were kind of happy times throughout the journey, throughout the story, like meeting the other family, uncle playing the spoons, you will see that the background is lighter, and all of the pictures with kitten will also be lighter. When the dog is barking kitten up the tree, not a happy time, it'll be a little bit darker. Uh, when the men come rushing up on horses trying to be intimidating, not a good time. So the storm, all of those things will be a lot darker. Um, happy times lighter and as an artist you get to play with color and shadow that way. I like that this story is also a little piece of activism by this particular family. They were not going to stand by and just take the government's broken promises. All throughout history, us as Indigenous peoples all across Canada and all across the world are faced with broken promises every day and not only treaty promises and we are just starting to have a voice and take a stand against racism and oppression. It's like a little piece of reconciliation that um, I'm able to tell this important part of Saskatchewan's history and I'm very humbled to be a part of it. Merci. Miigwech. Thank you, Christina. It's great to hear how much thought goes into each illustration. Now, as a special way to close the book launch, the next 20 orders of Rotolown's Kitten Broken Promises to come through our online store, www.shopmetis.ca, will be signed editions by Wilfred. One signed copy per order. Thank you again to Nora, Christina, Wilfred, and all of you for watching. Marcy.